Hello, buongiorno. Buongiorno. I'm, I'm a professor of Italian studies at the University of Florida. I've spent most, spent most of my academic life studying and teaching the Divine Comedy, and uh, recently I've become very interested in how the comedy reflects the very early stages of the age of exploration. I'm here today with my good friend Fabian Alfi. How are you today? Hi. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Well, I'm coping. You're coping. Forgot. So we're, uh, in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> we're in the midst of a pandemic. That's correct. So my name's Fabian Alfi, and I'm a professor of Italian here at the University of Arizona. And similarly, I've been, you know, spent my career interested in Dante, teaching medieval literature, and specifically, I'm interested in the ways that Dante employs satire as it was understood at the time. So we are going to talk today about Inferno 26. Um, of course, this is the famous canto of Ulisse. What I think is significant about this, uh, in terms of where this canto falls in the Inferno, uh, is that it's one of those cantos we kind of slide into. We have the vestiges of the previous canto, the circle of thieves. Uh, and so Dante opens it with this huge invective, Goldi Fiorenza, you know, your fame is so great that uh, everybody knows you around the world for being thieves. And then suddenly we find ourselves um, overlooking this almost idyllic setting of the fireflies. And mm -hmm. they, I think almost falls over, you know, and I often think of this falling in love. He's somewhat um, seduced by this vision right away. He goes from his anger to, oh, look how nice. And then Virgil's one who kind of pulls him away from the edge. Um, where are we? We are in the Malebolge at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Circle. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, which punishes fraud in its various forms. There are 10 of the Malibolge, um, and, uh, but when Dante in Canto 11 explains the, the subtypes of fraud, there are more than 10. So sometimes they're doubled up in some of the Malibolge, the, they're doubled up. So for instance, we have um, pimps and seducers um, and so forth. In this case, we only have the one. Unfortunately, he, uh, in that portion in Canto 11, he gives us a long list of the types of fraud and he says, and similar filth, uh, you know, and unfortunately, this is the similar filth. We have to conjecture, and it's a reasonable conjecture that this is people who fraudulent counsel, um, but he doesn't actually say it. So that's one of the things that I always find fascinating, you know, when I teach this is I'd say to my students, you know, what do we make of this? Right, right. Right. What is he, what's he actually doing here? And so one of, one of the things that, again, with my own students, we talk about this, you know, this happens very frequently in, in the Inferno. And scholars have spent so much time trying to figure out, well, what is this person's actual sin? And I think in the case of Ulysses, it's actually kind of interesting. I, I caution my students and I caution myself to always start from the premise that these people are in hell. Why do we expect verisimilitude from them? Why are we expecting truth from them? And so if we can also look at Inferno 26 in the context of the canto that follows, the Guido da Feltro, whose his, his own imagery is very much linked to that of Inferno 26 within the sort of the maritime imagery of, of sailors, et cetera. But at the very end of Inferno 27, there's this ridiculous little pantomime uh, where Guido talks about having almost made it to heaven, St. Francis is pulling him up, and then you know, this black devil pulls him down. And I look at my students, do you, quite apart from the question of, do you think any of this actually happened? Do you think this even happened? These people hmm. are liars. So why are we even assuming that Ulysses' story is not intended to completely divert Dante's attention? Which really is what the Trojan horse was all about. Right. right. <laughs> to right. divert someone's attention. Distraction, right? And isn't that what we see even when, and I always see this canto as very much linked to Inferno 5 with the pair, right? Oh, right. Two flames, the pairing of the two bodies. One does all the talking. Here, let me take care of it. I'll handle this. 
And so that, I think these, these are all about seduction. And that's really even what happened Dante. So, you know, his eyes are sparkled. Like, oh, look at this sparkly thing. And Virgil's like, dude, come back. Come back. Yeah. Fall into that trap. Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of Ulysses. But I think um, you've been looking a little bit about, at how this is linked back to Inferno 2 as well. Right. And in fact, um, you know, in Inferno 2, Dante stops before they even enter hell. And, you know, he's concerned about the authorization. Is, is this an authorized journey into the afterlife? And there are links here. One of the things is he says, I'm afraid that this trip will be uh, folle, is the word he uses. Um, uh, Temo che la venuta non sia folle, and that's in line 35. And um, Ulysses talks about his voyage as a fall levolo, and that's in line 125 in, in our canto. Right. And so there's a link there. And, and in fact, Ulysses also says he wants to understand the world and human vices and human virtues. That's in line 99, which of course is what Dante is doing through the entire right. comedy. So he's sort of the negative example, assuming we can take his, his, uh, his word. His, his word. <laughs> He's the opposite of what Dante is doing. So that, you know, Dante has, as we recall from Canto II, it is an authorized journey with the three women in heaven who are telling him, you know, who are getting Virgil to move and so forth. This is the opposite where nobody authorized this and Virgil, or excuse me, Ulysses goes out uh, through the, the Straits of Gibraltar, which is a sign, he puts it, he calls it a sign. Right. And he goes beyond the sign. You're not supposed to do that. Right, so it's the right. negative example of the positive. And I love that because it's the counter example. Right. And, and I think um, to go back to that point you made about the, the relationship between Ulisse and Dante, what's significant is that we see the presence of Ulisse in all three canticles, which does not happen with an awful lot of our characters, right? Mm -hmm. I always see him as a, as a counterfoil to Dante. Um, recently I've been reading, we were admiring a little earlier, my uh, Leroy Jones' System of Dante's Hell. Um, it is touchy reading, be careful with the undergraduates with it, but his, when he encounters or, or his take, uh, Leroy Jones' take on Ulysses, is precisely that kind of introspection where the author looks at himself and his alter ego, looks at himself and his own desires. And in many respects, this, it, it, the rendering that Leroy Jones does of it has nothing to do with Ulysses or, or a voyage to the new world, but it does reflect that mirroring that when Dante is looking in lo specchio and trying to figure out who, who could I, who would I have been but for, but for grace? And mm -hmm. to think about, and, and I've, I've talked about this in some of my other work, you know, Dante's Guido poem from when he was a young man, Guido Io Vorrei. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'd love to get the heck out of this, this tight confines of Florence, get out on the open sea and go where the wind takes us. And so that whole idea also of the vein thought, right, of this wind, this unbridled wind, then brings us back to Inferno 5, right? Again, and I just recently, by the way, I've been thinking about when Dante says, I'm not Paolo, I'm, you know, I'm not Paolo. We're always thinking St. Paul, but <laughs> I think about Francesca and Paolo, right? Ah! <laughs> yeah, Paul being the other man in the triangle, right? That's right. Um, but, but this whole idea that Dante just, you know, as a young man, wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. I, I want to go, I want to go where the wind takes me. I want to do whatever I want to do. That's the child, right? But right. A child, I thought as a child, is very Pauline. And then what we see is what happens when you go where you feel like it, with you say, and it doesn't end well. Right. It doesn't end well. So I think that's, you know, that whole idea of authorized, unauthorized. Dante's conscious of this. And that, that, that maritime imagery happens throughout the caution, you know, well, we're going to be navigating some difficult waters here. That's right. Be careful. Y'all have that's to be right. careful now. Um, and later in the, in the yeah. com comedy, if I can jump in, later in the yeah, comedy, yeah, here we have a, a shipwreck. And that we have a couple of shipwrecks in hell. But, you know, starting, as you alluded at the beginning of 
Paradiso, but also um, the end of Paradiso, the beginning of Purgatorio too, we have journeys that are completing or completed. I'm reminded of the very end, um, the hundredth canto of the comedy, where he, he talks, he, he gives us this metaphor and he says, it was you know, as much wonder as, Ar uh, as New Neptune did when the ship, the Argo, passed right. over. So you can picture the god at the bottom of the sea looking up going, what, what is that, you know? Up, but it's a, completed, it's a completed voyage. Right counterpoise to this, which is yeah. a shipwreck. It wasn't completed. Yeah. Well, the, other, yeah. the other thing that occurred to me is that, you know, um, Ulysses, you don't see it quite so much, but he was a king. You see it with Guido da Montefeltro. These are political figures. Yeah. And we shouldn't forget that Dante himself was, had been a political figure. <laughs> Right. And the the uh, the desire to just simply get things done. Well, I'll just say whatever to get things done. You know, right. the, the uh, if this is truly um, uh, fraudulent counselors or people who counsel or encourage things in a fraudulent manner, well, the temptation must have been there for him as well to you know let's just get something done. And okay, if I if I spin it wrong or if I you know just lie entirely, well, who yeah. cares? You know. But they say um, anything, right? And that's the the, the, oraton, the oration picciola, right? Exactly, you know. <laughs> you know anything to, you know, considerate vostre semenes, right? That's you know, right. He, he appeals to the very heart of what it means to be a Greek man, right? You know. That's right. But you're not afraid of a little danger, are you? Come on, we've done a million things like this is easy, guys. Come on, come on. The shaming almost, right? Like if you're not exactly. Even, you're not in, and, and so there's a, there's a sort of bullying aspect here. There's the peer pressure, the seduction, uh, the selling of a dream, right? And and so I think that it's kind of uh, they all play into what Dante himself is able to do, but he's right. also aware of the disastrous consequences. And you know, to go back to the Guido poem, you know, this dream of a young man, you know, Guido and Beatrice and this whole gang. By the time the Commedia um, is, is being written, you know, Dante's in exile, Guido's dead, probably Dante's fault, Beatrice is long gone, the dream is dead in the water, right? right. Um, <laughs> so you see this, you see this continually, the, 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 the aspiration, but then the very, very terrible consequences of doing it without care. Right. Caution to the wind, as it were. Right. And so the, the imagery, as I said, in, in Inferno 5, um, is this unauthorized moment. And you know, when we think about Francesca and Paolo together, again, I say to my students, what are they doing there in the first place? <laughs> it was not a very, you know, I, I can't think of too many households in which sitting reading with your brother-in-law with no chaperone is condoned. That's right. So let's start with Francesca, you know. Oh, I'm so unaware. Why were you there? Right. Were you there? I, I, what, what, what they would say now is when people say, well, come over, we'll Netflix and chill, you know. It's like, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, come up to my room. We'll read this book. Yeah. It's, I'll show you my etchings. <laughs> I'll show you my etchings. That's right. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> Wrong. We know, what, we know what's up. And so that's what you know, I often think about that awareness of, of sin before it happens, which of course plays out in Guido, the Montefeltro, right? right? Of course you were going to do this, right? You, the awareness of, of plunging forward. Um, and so that's again that moment where Virgil pulls him back and we see that Dante has this, still has this tendency to be enraptured. Um, so we have the wind and then we have the fire, you know, there's this, the flames of, of excitement and this link to Pentecost has not been lost on anyone, you know, the speaking in tongues. That's right. And as, as, as a former lawyer, you know, very, this whole idea of the fraudulent counselor, um, this kind of fascinates me. Um, recently, I watched uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The Cohen Great Brothers. movie. <laughs> well, of course, his name is Ulysses, right? And if you watch carefully, you'll see that what he was in jail for was impersonating a lawyer. He's a fraudulent counselor, right? <laughs> and think about his statement when he says, oh, brother. And even at the end, oh, brothers, right? The ofrati, 
this whole creation, the lawyers, and this is what a lawyer is taught to do. Let me put it in terms you'll understand. Let me put it, you might recall the bookseller in the movie was Dan T. That's right, I remember that. <laughs> right. And only had one eye. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic, but it's all about that counsel, and be careful, it's, a, it's a, that gift of tongues is a very, very, very um, dangerous tool. Right. And I think Dante uses that word, you know, the, the danger that, that lies ahead. And we've seen, so let, let's think about this for a moment. Then how, what, how does this resonate today then, right? There's no right. Such thing as fraudulent counselors in the 21st century, right? <laughs> Do well, we I mean, politicians. That's right. Well, I mean, if we can draw a kind of the ugly parallel, which is, the, the in the 20th century, I mean, obviously Primo Levi, the very famous, right. the very famous uh, retelling of the story, right. um, and there, of course, we can think of all the lies that went into the development of, um, you know, of the Third Reich right. and so forth, and right. you know, the the very real shipwrecks that he was. I mean, let's let's not forget that one of his books is he so mess he so messy. I'm getting it wrong. I sommersie i salvati. <laughs> right. right. So, um, and so, and what's fascinating in that one is, you know, it's, it's instead of looking at Ulysses as um, possibly a liar, just the opposite of this romantic figure, which how he had been cast in the ninth right. century. And, you know, here's poor Primo Levi in Auschwitz desperately trying to reclaim his humanity. So when you read his retelling of it, you know, when he says, you know, you weren't born to live as animals and you realize that this is, you know, happening in the context of Auschwitz, that that's right. really fascinating. I mean, it's, it's so dramatic, you know. Well, and the echoing, the considerate. Exactly. Considerate. It just sort of jumps out, you know, considerate in Inferno 26 and considerate is a place where I'm warm. It's, exactly. It's right there. And let's think about what it means to be a human. So I always think of the, you know, Arbeit macht frei on the gateway, the portone of Auschwitz, which is precisely what Dante does, is take something that sounds familiar, permissiva, permissiva, you know, the, this perversion of the, of the gospel. And you see that also in Auschwitz, something that sounds familiar, make perfect sense. Right. It and pretends I, to be a it pretends to be a work camp. Right. But nobody was supposed to survive it. It is you know? a lie. so it's a complete lie, you know, right. like Completely. basically telling the people as they're coming in, you know, if you work, right. you'll be all right. Well, nobody was supposed to. No, you to won't. Survive. Nobody gets well, and it's that inversion again, right? You know, Dante talks about ver che faccia di menzogna. But this right. is a lie that has the face of truth. And so that right. version and the inversion that we see also with Ulisse, who really also is on the opposite side of, of Dante, right? You know, right. if you look at the cosmology of it, it's all about turning things upside down and, and going down when you really should be ascending. That's right. You're not going to believe this, but we are almost out of time oh, so you're kidding oh. lots. now we've got about three minutes left uh, of course we could talk all day but that's right on inferno 26 26 uh well this has been a blast i mean <laughs> you know there's so much to sink your teeth into with these you know I, i'm always struck as to how perfectly constructed each canto is. You know, he starts with the Go di Fiorenza and he talks about Florence's wings are spreading across the ocean. And then later he picks that wings up with, with the, the orcs. Yeah, and so it's tied together nicely, but then it, it, it's also set within the entire work so yes. nicely as well. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, the construction of it, the almost perfect symmetry and then the anti-symmetry that is continual throughout. Um, and it continues to fascinate me. Um, the wings, you know, the, you write, the whole idea of the flight. And then of course the opposite of that is, is Lucifero. You know, That's right. the, 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 the wings that cannot take flight. And you see this, the opposite, the beginning of purgatory, when you see the beautiful big, 
uh, flying boat as it <laughs> comes into view, right? And it's like that moment, if you've ever been in an airport just before dawn and you see the big light heading towards the runway. And it gets bigger and bigger and you realize, oh my gosh. So Dante has this, I, I would not call him a prophet, but very much a visionary. You know, That's right. these, these images that are archetypal, uh, that can have the counterpoint to each other, the positive and the negative. Um, and, and yet this continual presence of release and the shipwreck and the very precarious nature of flight, you know, the Icarus moment. And you go too close to the light. If you're unauthorized. That's right. If you, if you don't, yeah. If you don't have the ticket to ride, <laughs> don't try to get on the train. Don't try to get on the train. Um, listen, my good friend, it is always a pleasure seeing you. Always a pleasure. This is great. I, I thank uh, Alison Cornish and all of those who put this together. Uh, it's really been a joy, and I hope that uh, this enlightens some of us in the midst of this very, very dark days of the pandemic. So. That's right. Thank you all. Ciao. Ciao.